Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Nikki, for giving a talk. Um, and I guess uh, you can start now. Um, thank you. So uh, yes, please do ask questions, uh, just so I know um, I'm making sense. So let me start a new page. So um, yes, today I'm going to talk about uh, partitions with modular forms. And um, so, uh, so this talk is more about um, the methodology of how we can use um, modular forms themselves um, to come up with uh, interesting number theory uh, results. So uh, I will state a few facts. And um, if you've been to the part three course, modular forms, um, you'll have seen all of them. But um, if not, um, I will give you reasons to believe why they are true. So let's begin with um, uh, the first part uh, of um, the title, so partitions. So the way to approach partition um, here is uh, a generating function. So, okay, let's start by defining uh, Pn to be the number of partitions that n has, so where n is a positive integer. So let's give an example. P of five is seven. Uh, so we can list them out. So one of them is uh, five ones, uh, get a two, a three, a four, and then three more. So two plus two plus one, three plus two, and a five. So these are the seven partitions uh, of five. And there are many good reasons to um, discuss partitions. For example, uh, P of N is the number of cycle types that um, the symmetric group SN have. So uh, knowing how PN grows and um, uh, so the patterns of it can help you, for example, check if you've left out cycle types. So, um, so let's talk about the generating function. So uh, one way to see, uh, to put this in a more compact form, is to notice that uh, we can actually write this as an infinite sum. So these increment by one, uh, these increment by two, and these by three, and so on. So this is an infinite product. So to see how uh, this makes sense, let's look at a particular example of um, P of five. So P of five, I want to look at the coefficient of X to the five. And let's take a look at this one, uh, three plus one plus one. So the way to extract the three plus one plus one is, so I get the three here and the two copies of one, I can get them from, so basically two copies of one and these combine to give X to the five. So that's a that's a nice way to put things. So uh, also you can see that uh, because uh, one plus x plus x squared and so on, uh, it's just one divided by one minus x. So I can also write this as an infinite product. So this is a really compact way. Uh, of showing uh, PN, but actually we haven't actually uh, we haven't got anything new. So, but I can actually show you on uh, a program that um, I can actually uh, show this. So, let me get this out. So I can do the same thing, um, and I can get. Uh, the infinite series up to uh, set to the 30. And when I put this out, you can see, um, so, uh, so the coefficient of Z to the N is PN. And you can see that it grows quite rapidly. For example, P of 30 is uh, 5,000 and something. All right, but anyway, um, we will need a better way of uh, using this formula to get interesting uh, 
theorems and results on the number of partitions. So uh, this is where modular forms come in. So that's the second part of the talk. So we're going to give definitions and examples. So let's begin with the definition. So modular form of, um, so uh, we are always going to assume this uh, has level SO2Z. So I won't repeat that again. Uh, and weight K, uh, where K is an integer, is, so let's get the first part here, is a holomorphic function F defined on the upper half plane. So the upper half plane here is um, where the imaginary part is positive. with uh, two extra conditions. So first of all, uh, so the SO2 set comes in play here. So if I've got matrix A, B, C, D, and it's in SO2 Z, uh, and um, tau is in the upper half plane, F of A tau plus B, C tau plus D, to the minus k, that's where the k comes in, uh, is equal to f of tau. So um, this thing here looks like, uh, you may uh, remember it from um, the Möbius transformation. So that's a very interesting um, condition to have. Let's put a star here. And the second condition is uh, a limit. So the holomorphic uh, part guarantees it's um, well-defined everywhere in the upper plane, but also we are going to need a condition at infinity um, because we need to uh, get some extra conditions in. So basically that's three conditions, even though I only wrote two here because this is also. And um, so this is where I will state some facts. Um, so first of all, uh, when you look at, at the condition star, it seems that you have to check way too many things. But in fact, you only have to uh, check two particular cases. One zero one and zero minus one one zero. And um, so I'll basically state the reason. Uh, the reason it is um, this, this, and the scalar matrix minus one zero zero minus one. Um, these three, uh, they generate as L two Z. So um, and also, if you look at uh, minus one, zero, zero, minus one, it's uh, minus tau divided by minus one. So um, there's no content here. So that's basically why you only need to check uh, two of them. So this will be uh, very important later on. So the second fact is, uh, so let's in particular consider one, one, zero, one. So let's go back to the definition. And um, so A is one, B is one, C zero, D one. So that's tau plus one and zero tau plus one is one. So we get F of tau plus one is F of tau. And uh, so we are dealing with um, period, some sort of periodic function with period one and uh, one, let's say function, 
that has period one is um, e to the two pi i tau. And uh, in fact, uh, because we are only dealing with the upper half plane, so we can get a consistent um, branch of logarithm on the upper half plane. So what we can actually do is to write f of tau to be f tilde of e to the two pi i tau. And f tilde will be well defined. And um, so let's look at the second definition that we have. So we need the limit at infinity, basically, at infinity to exist. But the limit at infinity, which uh, if you look at this, uh, so when the imaginary part of tau goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So basically what we want, uh, uh, this in defining a modular form, we also required f tilde to be a holomorphic function uh, in the complex plane, right? because at zero, that's tau infinity. So by Taylor's theorem, uh, we can actually write f tilde to be a Taylor series centered at zero. And uh, by writing q is e to the two pi i tau, we can write f to be uh, sum from zero to infinity, a and q to the n. So um, the minus parts don't come because um, it's a, a removable singularity at zero. So again, this will be very important later on. And the third part is some, um, so let's assume k is at least four. And basically, we will from now on uh, only consider k positive. So we want to look at the space of modular forms. So I will write mk. Uh, this is, first of all, a vector space. Over c. And uh, that's not too hard to see because, uh, for example, if I've got F1 and F2, they are two modular forms. Um, the sum of them certainly is a holomorphic function. And the limit at infinity is just the sum of the limits. And uh, for this uh, condition star, um, so F plus G, so you can just take them out. And uh, you can recover this condition easily. And the same goes for a scalar multiplication. Uh, so if you multiply by a scalar, it's still holomorphic. The limit at infinity is still well defined, and uh, the condition star is also true. But another thing that um, we won't be able to prove here is that it is a finite dimensional vector space. And this is only true because we impose the condition at infinity. So, and uh, we're going to do that. Uh, we are going to use this um, fact in two places. So first of all, I'm going to state that um, the dimension of the space of modular forms of weight four is one. And secondly, uh, the space of modular forms of weight 12, but we also impose the condition. Oh. Uh, let's write it here. So we also need um, the limit at infinity to be zero. So again, uh, imposing this condition, um, it's still a vector space because um, if you add two things at infinity, which are zero, it's also zero. So that's also has uh, dimension one. So we will need all three of them later on. But uh, for now, let's begin with an example. So uh, one of the first examples we're going to see, so uh, we've just defined a bunch of things. Uh, 
it would be quite weird if um, I define so many things and then there's nothing like the vector space is empty it's only the zero function so that wouldn't be good so I'm going to see that uh, uh, this vector space actually has something in it so I'm going to look at this function gk uh, which is called the weight k Eisenstein series And here I'm going to assume k is at least four. So um, it's defined in the upper half plane. And gk of tau is uh, the sum over integers mn that are not both zero. And the sum is m tau plus n to the k. Uh, so we want to show that this is a modular form. The first thing to show is actually that um, it is a holomorphic function. So um, I'm going to skip a bit on uh, the details, but basically what you show is, um, uh, so in every uh, compact set, um, uh, it is uh, absolutely bound, uh, it is absolutely uh, bounded and um, each of the terms here, uh, are uh, differentiable. So this is just a, 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 like a polynomial. So um, if you get uh, some of them and you can so do something like this to extend it to the whole uh, apart thing. So let's just assume we know that this is a holomorphic function. So there are two more things to show. The first thing is that uh, at infinity, uh, it has a limit. So because this is absolutely convergent, uh, we can just take uh, tau to be infinity and um, uh, substitute uh, that to each individual term. So uh, if m is not zero, uh, you get basically one over infinity, which goes to zero. So we only need to consider m is zero, and uh, you might be familiar with this. And in fact, this is just two times zeta k, where zeta is the Riemann zeta function. Uh, so that's two because we are talking about the integers instead of the natural, so we get both sides. Oh, we're going to assume k is even here also. Otherwise, that's just zero. So because, um, yeah, if you go, uh, take m n to be minus m minus n, they just cancel out each other completely. So anyway, we get two times zeta k. So the limit at infinity um, exists. So again, the star condition, we have to show that. Right. So let's take a look at that again is this. Um, so now I'm going to cheat a little. And um, so let's have gamma to be A, B, C, D in SL2Z. And uh, I'm just going to write gamma tau to be A tau plus B, C tau plus D. Again, inspired by um, uh, the Möbius transformation action. So let's look at GK gamma tau times c tau plus d to the minus k. And so one way to write this, let's see, to write this is to define a lattice. So I can write uh, this here. So. to be the sum over the lattice lambda tau, which is uh, so, let me do this. So that's the set of uh, complex numbers P tau plus Q, 
where P and Q are integers, not both zero. So if we write this, so we actually get a very nice form of this. So that's just a sum of elements in, we've got an, now not lattice lambda tau, but uh, lambda gamma tau because the, uh, gamma tau here, and we just get the minus k here. And we got that extra for us. And uh, we can group them together. So now we are left um, to show that this is actually equivalent to this. And then um, by absolute convergence, we can actually rearrange the sums. But okay, let's see what this is. Uh, so if we expand everything out, it's uh, so we still got p, so that we got p tau plus q, but now we've got a tau plus p divided by c tau plus d. That cancels out with the denominator, plus a tau plus b, and q with c tau plus d. And this is the same. And uh, we can group them together, the tau's together. This is the same. Right, but now let's assume that we want to recover one, one element. Uh, let's see we want, let's say we want this to be R, this to be S, R is above um, integers and not both zero. But we are now just solving the matrix. So A, P, C, Q, so A, P, C, Q, B, P, D, Q is R, S. Right, but this is just um, gamma transpose. And if gamma is in SL to Z, it's inverse is certainly in SL to Z. And um, so it's this transpose. So we can actually get a unique solution, uh, P, Q, that gives us R, S. So we conclude that this must be our original lattice, lambda tau. So when we look back, uh, we see that this is actually just GK of tau. But that certainly means that um, it satisfies uh, condition star for all uh, matrices gamma. So GK is a modular form of weight k because uh, it's a minus k here. Right, so uh, we're going to do something else here. We're going to define, uh, just uh, for convenience, we're going to define the normalized Eisenstein series gk to be gk divided by two times zeta k. Uh, you, you might remember two times zeta k is the limit at infinity. So uh, we have the limit at infinity. To be one. Now, that's um, quite nice because we've now got uh, a lot of these uh, modular forms we can look at. In particular, we want to look at two of them. The first one is E4. This has weight four. E six. This has weight six. And uh, four and six has at least common multiple twelve. So if I put E four cubed, this has weight twelve. And if I put E six squared, this has weight twelve. And if I take the difference between them, if we look at the limit at infinity, that's one cubed. That's that's one cubed. That's one squared. So this vanishes at infinity. So this is of weight 12 because uh, this is a sum of modular forms of weight 12. And this vanishes at infinity. 
Right, again, we are going to ask ourselves a question. So again, we've got one function and then another function, and then we take the difference of those functions and we found out at infinity, it's zero. Uh, okay, is it possible that it's just the zero function? Uh, then uh, again, what we've done is quite pointless. But right, let's see why this cannot be the case. So uh, the method to do this is to show that at one point, it's not zero. So let's take a look at the point I. So let's look at E6 of I. Uh, we're going to do something. So because uh, I to the six is minus one, so uh, E6 of I con consists of terms like one divided by N I plus N to the six. Uh, but now I'm going to do something, which is to divide the denominator by I. So since I divided by I, uh, when I take the sixth uh, power, I just recover a copy of minus one. So in fact, these two add up to be zero. But you see, uh, I can actually do this for every pair of integers m and n. So because um, if I cycle m uh, like m i plus n by multiplying by i, after four times I recover the original. So I can always pair um, one of one, one of these to another to get zero. So everything cancels out, basically. So E6 of I is zero. So, right, we're left to uh, see that um, E4 of I is not zero. Then um, it will be a non-trivial function. So to do this, we're going to need a little bit of help. Uh, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to use a, a similar argument, but now I'm going to need the complex plane with me. So by the same argument uh, in the complex plane, if I multiply by I, I'm rotating by 90 degrees, but I to the four is one. So I can basically only look at uh, the first quadrant And uh, the result is basically uh, what I got from here and then multiplied by four. So I need to show that um, the absolute value of the modulus of E4 of I is not, uh, is not zero. So uh, we, we don't have zero, zero. And uh, maybe it would be more convenient to consider G of G4, right? Because um, showing that um, E4 of I is non-zero is the same as uh, showing G4 of I is non-zero and G4, we have a nicer form. So G4 of I is uh, terms one divided by MI plus N to the four. And uh, I'm going to draw some squares. Uh, and then uh, this has length one, this has length two, and so on. And uh, I only need to look at these points. Uh, this is zero one, which is uh, one zero, and then multiplied by i. And uh, you can see that uh, on, for example, this part of the square, there are, if this is n, there are two n points. So we are going to use the triangle inequality. So to take the differences. So the max of M and N is at most one. Uh, we need M to be positive and to be non-negative. So minus. Uh, this one only has uh, 
to have two terms, this and this. And then the first one is one zero, uh, i to the four is one, so that's one. The second term is one plus i, and then one plus i is a uh, square root two times e to the two pi divided by eight, I think. So if you uh, also, uh, take the fourth power, that's uh, basically minus a quarter, square root two to the four, right? And for this here, we're going to take the modulus of this. So we can further, wait, right, sorry. That's this. And uh, we're going to take the uh, modulus inside. And uh, because M and N are at least two, uh, the modulus is at least, let's say, M to the four, and N to the four. And there are two N terms. So that's 2n, the sum, yeah, divided by n to the 4. And uh, if I um, take in the 1 as well, that's 3 divided by 4. If I add 2, that's 11 divided by 4 minus 2. Um, yeah. So we need to show that uh, the sum is less than 11 divided by eight. And um, right now, uh, this is relatively easier because um, we know this, uh, the pi squared divided by six, and we can uh, basically take out the terms one, two, and three. And um, this is uh, directly compare it to uh, each individual term and get the result. So basically we can do that. Um, sorry, did, did you not uh, write the inequalities the wrong way around? Uh, just just the, the first two. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right, thank you. So basically, yeah, uh, we can do this. So right after, what is it? About like 15 minutes, we've shown that uh, this thing here, e4 cubed minus e6 squared, is a modular form that vanishes uh, that vanishes at infinity and is not zero. So that's nice. So um, we're going to do something quite funny here. We're going to define, uh, because now e4 cubed minus e6 squared is a valid modular form to, to consider. We're going to define it up to scaling to be delta. And uh, here I'm going to state a few more facts and then we can actually start proving um, the main theorem. I think the facts here. So the first thing here is um, we can actually show that uh, delta is, uh, if you remember in the, almost at the beginning, we, can, we talked about the Q expansion. So delta has the Q expansion to the end of the 24, uh, where Q is e to the two pi i tau. So the way to prove this is that, um, that um, the right-hand side here has weight 12, and then because S12 only has dimension one, so it's always uh, this up to scaling and to show that um, the scaling factor is one. So, uh, to show that this has weight 12, uh, we only need to show this on, basically we have to show, uh, let's see. We have to show two things basically. Uh, because the, the, first fact, uh, the first fact, I think, we only need to show 1101 and one minus 110. And uh, the fact, uh, the thing about putting this in Q expansion is um, it automatically has period one because Q has period one. So that's good. The second thing we need to show is this 
And to show this, we only need to show this is true on um, a part of the upper half plane that has an accumulation point, and then we are done with the identity principle. So uh, in particular, I'm going to choose um, the imaginary axis. So uh, minus one divided by i y is, I think, i divided by y, and that's y to minus 12. And if you pull everything out, so um, let's take y to be quite large. So then uh, e to the two pi i tau is uh, now is e to the minus two pi y. If y is very big, um, delta is about q. And uh, this would be, uh, so e to the minus two pi divided by y and the product. This is e to the minus. Uh, Again, if y is very large, this um, factor here is, a, is approximately zero. So we actually have to show, uh, um, no, not that we, uh, if we show this, this is uh, automatically true, but I'm going to convince you that um, this approximation is actually the case. And to do this, I'm going to use a program. And uh, so on the left side, I'm going to see uh, what e to the two pi y times um, y to the 12 is. So I'm going to take it, uh, y to the 500,000. That's quite big. So as you can see, it's about uh, 10 to the minus 1.36 million. So this is a really, 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 really small number. And uh, let's see uh, if we take the infinite product, we get something similar. So uh, again, y is 500,000 and uh, we can't do an infinite product, but we can go to let's say 2 million. And uh, this will take a while. So as you can see, I'm, I've, I'm not actually going to infinity, but uh, I'm going to 2 million terms and you can see that the first five uh, digits actually agree with each other. So uh, that's uh, quite a good reason to believe that uh, uh, the things we are considering actually have uh, has worked well. Right, so that's the first fact. Done. So the second fact is uh, I'm going to actually uh, show uh, what the Q expansions of um, E4 and E6 are. And these will be very helpful in uh, proving the theorem. And um, to, uh, the way to do this is uh, actually you use um, uh, an expansion for, um, I think, cotangent uh, pi tau and do a lot of expansion. But uh, here we're going to um, omit those. So for E4, the Q expansion is sigma three of n to the n. So uh, sigma k of n is a sum of devices to the power k uh, positive. Uh, the second one we need is E6. So as you can see, four, that goes to three, and the six here is five. And uh, I'm going to define another thing here, E2, uh, which looks quite similar. So this is almost like uh, the normalized Eisenstein series I was talking about, uh, but not really because uh, you can't really do this as we did here, because if we are doing squares, uh, you can't take, uh, this doesn't converge absolutely because 
uh, the uh, is squares. And then uh, when you take, uh, so as we did the square here for approximation, we get another copy of N. So um, asymptotically, this is like uh, the harmonic series, which certainly doesn't converge. But uh, by defining it in this way, we already know that E2 of tau plus one is E2 of tau because we've got the Q expansion. Uh, so there is, let's just say a fact here. So um, so let's see, if this were true, then it is almost like a completely like um, uh, a modular form, except it doesn't converge at infinity. But in fact, we don't, we get something left over. And again, to show this, I'm going to show this uh, is true, not, not true, but uh, demonstrate this on uh, the uh, part of the imaginary line. And let's see what we get. That's I divided by Y. So let's put this in the front. That's 6Y divided by pi minus y squared e2 of tau. Again, when y is very, very big, um, q is very, very, very close to zero because it's exponential. So it's e to the minus two pi y. And if y grows, uh, e to the two pi minus two pi y is going to uh, decay even more rapidly. So uh, again, this is approximately one. So we're going to need to see this. And um, again, I'm going to use a program for this. So this time I'm going to do um, left-hand side minus uh, right-hand side. So uh, this time I'm taking uh, Y to be 200,000 and uh, the sum is going to uh, 4 million. So that's the Y squared, six Y divided by pi, uh, the one in the beginning. So yeah, the difference is about 10 to the minus 29, up to 4 million terms. And uh, so if you look at the both sides of the equation, they are like 6y divided by pi. So they are about, um, let's say, 10 to the 5. So the fact that they are close to each other by about 10 to the minus 29, again, gives you very good reasons to believe uh, why this is true. Right, so we are done with the facts. Now we only need to, to um, we are actually able to show uh, the last things. So let's see. Uh, we're going to consider this expression here. So uh, again, we are considering this. Um, we're trying to show that this is a modular form. So again, we need to show that at infinity, this is uh, the limit that exists. Uh, this certainly does, uh, because uh, if you take uh, the derivative of the, Q's, uh, of the Q expansion, uh, the constant term drops out and everything uh, you're left with is um, something to do with Q. And uh, because Q is e to the two pi i tau, so dQ d tau would be, uh, so you get the two pi i out and e to the two pi i tau. So that's just Q. So as you go to infinity, uh, it certainly goes to zero. So at infinity, this goes to zero, and this is one. So at infinity, this is what to find. And the next thing we're going to show is uh, uh, 
the uh, the condition star. So what happens when tau goes to tau plus one? Again, uh, because we've got a Q expansion, this is automatically satisfied. So the last thing we need to do is, uh, so the matrix zero. So this is one, one, zero, one. This is zero minus one, one, zero. So let's think about this. Uh, we're going to do these things separately. And um, we want to do, we want to see E2 prime of minus one divided by tau. So the first thing we have is the chain rule. So uh, minus one over tau, uh, you would take the derivative is tau squared. Let's just write that. And inside is this. But now we've got uh, this relation here. So uh, let's see, that's tau squared E2 plus six tau divided by I pi. And now we're going to use the product rule here. The first one give us, gives us two tau, E2. So that's two, uh, canceling the two here. That's tau cubed, E2, divided by I pi. Uh, the second term is tau squared, E2 prime. So that tau to the four with the tau squared here, two pi I, E2 prime. Uh, the last term is uh, six divided by I pi because um, derivative uh, with respect to tau. So that's six, six and the two here cancels out. So we get three, uh, that's the tau squared, but we get i pi all squared. So that's minus pi squared. What about this term here? This is, uh, I'm going to do the minus later on. So that's 12 of tau squared e2 plus six tau i pi squared. Again, the first term relatively simple. The second term, we get six times two and then tau cubed. So six times two, first of all, we cancels out, uh, that cancels out to 12. And then tau squared times tau, that's tau cubed e2 divided by i pi. And finally, that's six tau divided by i pi all squared. That's 36 divided by 12. That's minus, uh, that's three. And then i pi all squared is minus three tau squared i squared. And we are taking a difference between them. So that cancels. That cancels. So the difference is tau to the four, one over two pi i two prime minus, 12 of e2 squared, but that's exactly this. So this has weight four. And in the beginning, we mentioned, uh, we, uh, we stated the fact that uh, the space of modular forms of weight four have dimension one. And we know something that has a uh, weight four. The, that's the um, weight four Eisenstein series and by extension, the normalized Eisenstein series. So this is equal, this is equal to a constant times E4. Uh, so if you want to see what the constant is, we only need to look at uh, the Q expansion and the Q expansion, uh, the constant term, uh, this doesn't contribute anything. This gives us uh, a minus one divided by 12, so that k is minus one divided by 12. So actually, we get this condition. And uh, I'm going to uh, group this together. So let's, let's make this a little bit nicer because we can group the 12 on both sides. And this will turn out to be the last ingredient we need to prove um, the theorem. 
So part three, the theorem. So if you looked at um, the introduction, uh, you will see, uh, so uh, we, we go back to the number of partitions. If n is a natural number, then the number of partitions of five n minus one is divisible of five. So uh, we're going to need, like, we need something for us to uh, uh, look at in order like, to, to even approach this. So let's begin with uh, the only thing we know uh, here about partitions, which is this generating function. And the thing about this generating function is that it looks quite similar to this thing here. Uh, but uh, we didn't get that in the denominator, we get in the numerator, but uh, we can actually do something about this. So let's start with the delta. Which is, uh, if you remember, is this condition. And uh, I'm going to get a cheat sheet here, which writes down what uh, the things are that, so E4 is minus 240. Uh, I'm not going to write the things in the sum here. And finally, E2 is one, let's see, minus 24. All right, so we're going to consider things mod five. So let's see, what, about, what is happening in E4? Uh, okay. So E4 here, um, so we've got 240 here. That's divisible by five. So if we take a look at the Q expansion, and uh, so uh, this is sigma three of n, at, uh, and uh, sigma three of n is a sum of integers. So the whole thing here um, is a bunch of integers divisible by five. So we can do this. So we can actually cancel up. Uh, any number of powers of E4 if we want. Uh, we don't want to, we only want to cancel out two of them. And uh, let's look at E6 and E2. So that's 24 and 504. Um, the difference between them is divisible by five. What about the terms sigma five and sigma one? So sigma five of n is the sum of integers in the form of d to the five. This has this for sigma one, this is the same stuff, but d to the one. And uh, by Fermat's little theorem, they're congruent mod five. So E2 and E6 are congruent mod five. So we can do this. Uh, but if you see, we've got E4 minus E2 squared. And here, we got E2 squared minus E4. So uh, if you put the minus on both sides and multiply it by 12, uh, we get minus 12 times this thing. And uh, the final thing that I forgot to mention is, uh, I'm going to need another bracket here, which is that uh, one divided by two pi i, e2 prime, uh, if you expand it out uh, with the chain rule, that's e2 two pi i, d, dq, d tau, because that's d over d tau, and then d, dq, e2, 
And as I mentioned, dQ d tau is a 2 pi i times q. So the 2 pi i's cancel. That's q d to dq. So that actually is just minus 12 q d e to dq. Mod 5. Uh, and uh, again, uh, by the same um, reasoning, uh, delta has um, the coefficients in the Q expansion. Uh, so basically because um, you're trying to get, for example, uh, the uh, coefficient of Q to the 10, and you can basically expand it out and everything will be integers. So that's fine there. Uh, and um, I can um, add this by uh, a multiple of five. So uh, I can add, let's say, 1740 to get back 1728. And since 1728 and 5 are co prime, we get delta. And this are congruent mod 5. Right. But now let's, um, let's begin. with this. So we're going to need to do a bit of work here. This, as we saw, is the infinite product. So that's 24. But um, I want the minus one, because with the minus one, I can recover the uh, generating function of the partition function. So we want the minus one. And we'll just throw that out. That's the 25. So this here is what we need. And uh, if I multiply by Q, that's plus one. And um, I can um, change variables uh, to get let's say from two. So, but what about this term here? So uh, I'm only considering mod five and uh, I won't show this explicitly. You can, uh, you can almost try to um, expand it yourself, uh, although I don't recommend that. So um, one minus Q to the N to the 25, is congruent to one minus Q to the 25 N mod five. Um, the reason is um, 25 has uh, two copies of five in the factorization. Uh, so um, everything from one to 24, um, uh, get more copies of five in the factorization than in the denominator. So let's see. We can do this and put the 25 in. And we are almost at the end. So we look at the left hand side. That's congruent. So we bring this now to the right uh, to the right hand side. So uh, what is Q DE to DQ? So DE to DQ. Let's look at here. The e to dq is bringing the n down and multiplying this by q. So the qn drops by one and then up, like, goes up by one. So this is still qn. But instead of um, sigma one n, we get n times sigma one n here. And the one goes away. Let's see, uh, n, n. So this looks very similar to the partition function thing. Instead of n, we get 25 n. So what this is, is actually p n q to the 25 n. 
Now let's look at the coefficient of q to the 5n and we will be done. Because if we look at the coefficient of q to the 5n on the left-hand side, we get p, so 5n here, that's p of 5n minus one, all right? On the right-hand side, we want to get something that multiplies to, uh, sorry, that's the q to the n here. We want to get q to the 5n here, but to do this, we are going to, okay, this will be a sum of different terms, but we are always going to get 25 here. So we're going to get 25 times something here, and then we're going to get uh, 5n minus 25 times something. So in particular, 25 times something is five times something. So let's say we get 5k here, we're going to get 5n minus 5k here. So on the right hand side, we get a sum of terms in the form 5n minus 5k times some integer. We don't really care about this is an integer, this is an integer, uh, this is an integer, everything is an integer. But we've got a copy of five here. So that's congruent to zero mod five. And that's the end of the proof. And uh, there are other ways, uh, there are other formulas we can come up with uh, using a similar method. So for example, uh, Ramanujan also proved uh, for seven, there is this. Um, so if you wonder what the five comes from, that's minus two. And uh, the minus one comes from the fact that 25 minus one is 24. Uh, that's the 24 in the delta. And here we've got the minus two, the minus two is uh, the, let's see, seven squared. And that's the two here, minus one, that's it. 24 times two. Wait, not here. Here. So we get similar results, uh, even though we are going to need um, different series. And finally for 11. And of course there are other amazing formulas uh, which we can come up with, uh, but it's way uh, more, uh, harder to come up with. For example, uh, Ramanujan's uh, very famous asymptotic formula, So like these. So, uh, but, uh, so let's see. So that's the end of uh, what we are talking about in terms of combinatorics. But uh, actually, if we look at a few pages before, we were looking at uh, a specific uh, equation here, which we came up with uh, purely by considering uh, vector spaces, which is this. But you can also look at this in the Q expansion coefficient. And uh, I will do uh, everything out by hand, but uh, you can see that the E4, in the E4, you get sigma three of N. In the E2, you get uh, some sort of um, product. So that's sigma one N minus K, sigma one K. And here you get uh, N times sigma one N. Uh, let's only consider the, uh, the places where n is subprime, then we get very nice form because this is one plus p cubed. And this is uh, sigma one of n is one plus p. Uh, this we don't know anything about. But um, we can actually show this, just unpack uh, the coefficients of uh, this equation. you will actually see this really, really amazing formula. At least I found it extremely interesting. So this is just some sum, but it turns out this has got a really nice form. And you can try this yourself for P equals to seven, 11, 13, 17, and so on. This is always true. So there are way more things to um, do in modular forms. Thank you very much.
thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, this was dense. Does anyone have questions? Um, if not, then I guess I will have, uh, I will uh, ask one myself. Um, like, is the, is, the, is the theory afterwards uh, somewhat general results, or does it uh, continue to, uh, does it go on uh, as it, um, in this kind of uh, numerology where you use uh, like uh, specific uh, numerical facts to deduce uh, results? Uh, so I guess there are two ways to approach this because um, I guess uh, I guess the way Ramanujan did things is um, he just had them in his mind and he tried to prove them. So uh, modular forms is almost like um, a method to prove things instead of uh, to discover things. So because uh, I guess if you just start looking like here, if you don't mm -hmm. already know about the partition function, generating function, it's really hard to just go like to go through these steps to go to your answer. So I guess um, this is more about like this depends a lot more about um, on intuition than maybe other other uh, fields. Uh huh. Okay, but like the. Um... Do you do you keep having results about the about those specific numbers, or can you state uh, general results? Oh, um, you mean a uh, five, seven, and eleven? Yeah, stuff like this. Oh yes, um, uh, um, this doesn't work anymore. Uh, yeah, with um higher primes because uh, one key fact that we are going to use here is that uh this uh, the dimension is one, so if the dimension ah, yeah, okay. goes up to more than one, you can't really have uh. A clear result. Or you can get some result, and it will be very, very ugly and not very helpful. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And what's the rough ID for the for the for the for the space of curves of a dimension uh, uh, of a level four to be uh, to be one dimensional? So um to do that uh so uh. So like in, um, let's see, in uh, Riemann surfaces and so on, uh, like many other courses, you can uh, do uh, get valence formulas mm -hmm. uh, and uh, things like that. Um, so this is basically the same because we're also talking about um, holomorphic functions. So uh, the way to prove this is uh, you have to do uh, come up with the valence formula and you have to come up with that by uh, doing uh, contour integration and with the uh, argument principle and so on. So uh, this is done in the course in about, like, I guess, like in two lectures. So in about two lectures, you will come up with everything. You need to know. Okay. 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 Uh, well, if nobody has questions. Uh, I will thank you everyone for coming and uh, see you uh, next week for our talk uh, with uh, Professor Kukiniok, you will uh, soon hear about it. <laughs>